You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. I have uh, Ed Lorenzini. He's the uh, CEO and president of Analyze Corp. And I also have Scott Chase. He's the CTO of Analyze Corp. So, Ed and Scott, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Yeah, uh, good. How are you? Great. Good, good. So tell me about uh, Analyze Corp. What's the premise of the company? Yeah, this is uh, Ed. And uh, Analyze Corporation is a data analytics company. Uh, we specialize in predictive analytics, uh, and we're doing a lot with consumer behavior. Uh, we've been able to aggregate very large amounts of consumer data, and we've uh, used AI technologies to build a very user-friendly um, front end that our customers can um, do to do micro-segmenting for uh, B2C uh, activities that they're involved in. Okay, so what would be an example of uh... You know, what's a, I don't know if you can name a specific, but what is a company that you work with and what do they sell and, you know, what data are they analyzing they weren't analyzing before? Yeah. So uh, our uh, platform is called Analyze Client, and uh, we leverage 220 million U.S. people, data on 220 million U.S. people, and we have about 365 consumer variables on those, and we aggregate that from various sources, uh, Axiom, Experian, the credit bureaus. And uh, our um, user interface is used by B2C companies, uh, some uh, large, some small. We feel like this really serves the uh, small to medium-sized markets. So uh, primarily advertising companies who uh, want to do a consumer micro-segmentation for a customer of theirs. So uh, some examples we've seen, uh, advertising companies are using this uh, for um, direct mail for um, telephone calls in some cases, for uh, emails. And we've been able to uh, connect to some social media platform as well for advertising. Okay, so if I sell a widget and I've had, you know, 100 people buy the widget on my website the past month, <clears throat> I send you the data and you tell me, ooh, you know, 46% were baby boomers with, you know, adult age children that, you know, own their own home and, you know, I don't know, love, you know, foreign cars, that kind of stuff. And then I can take that data and, send very specific communications to them through email or mail. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, and our, our platform, uh, the innovation in our platform, and our CTO, Scott, can tell us more about this uh, as we go along. But the big innovation is that we've invented a way to develop an automated custom algorithm on the fly. So our customers upload uh, their data, which is their current customer's name and address, into our platform. We look all of those up and we build an automated math model for that specific group when they do that. And then we're able to do three things. The first thing we do is what you said. We create a report, all the sociometric, psychographic, and demographic information for them so they can really know who their customers are. Uh, second, we're able to then score all their customers for uh, propensity, capacity, and lifetime value. So, uh, you know, numbers they can use to to sort for upselling and cross-selling. And then finally, what we're able to do is use that math model, put it back into the data we have, and they can find 100, 1,000, 10,000 new potential customers who have those same features. Uh, so it's a much better targeted audience. So I guess some of the tricks here is, is identifying who has either come to your website or opted in or bought a product with as little data as possible, maybe just an email field or you know, email and IP combination, that kind of thing. That's some of the, the magic I've seen that, you know, people have been able to do. Uh, is that part of your focus or is it purely the analysis side? 
Well, that's a good point. And um, we're primarily doing a traditional analysis, uh, a traditional segmentation analysis. So we're using uh, our customers' data in terms of their customers' first name, last name, and address. We're able to look all those people up, get a lot of variables on each of those, and build our model. Um, sometimes our customers come to us and they'll say, well, I only have an email address you know, for this prospect group that I have or this customer list. And then we have ways to cross-reference that back to physical name and address. But that's where we're starting with physical name and address. And then we have uh, the ability to do what we've talked about. So what is the uh, micro-segmentation? You know, the normal segmentation, I know you'll, you, you know, you'll go along either demographic lines or you know, you'll get age and a few other factors, income. But what, what does micro-segmentation mean and what's an example of the power of it? Yeah, I'm going to... Uh, let Scott, our CTO, talk about that, uh, and um, you'll um, see a little more. I think what we're talking about in terms of the de- you know the depth that we can go with the uh, analysis that that we do, how targeted it is. But uh, Scott, would you like to uh, pick up there and uh, maybe respond to the question? Uh, sure. So of the uh, roughly 380 variables um, that we have for U.S. households. Um, the majority of them, uh, over 200 of them, are consumer lifestyle variables. Um, so you can imagine things like owns a dog or um, enjoys boating or subscribes to magazines, these kinds of uh, consumer lifestyle variables. Um, so what we do in a um, micro-segmentation analysis is we give you all of the traditional uh, psychographic, sociometric, demographic information for uh, your customers, so with their age, their income, their homeowner status, whether they have children in the home, uh, their, um, you know, uh, what kind of housing they live in, that sort of thing. Um, but in addition, we can build a model um, based off of these lifestyle variables. So we can tell you that for your specific product, uh, your product does well uh, with women who buy jewelry and patronize the arts. Uh, and uh, who are looking for value when they, they shop at discount stores. Uh, and so our uh, micro-segment is basically made up of the traditional segmentation information plus the most relevant uh, psychographic variables for your audience. And these are not by um, uh, uh, predefined categories, uh, the way that some uh, data science firms do it, where they've just divided the whole U.S. into 80 categories or whatever. We actually build the segment for your product based on the actual buying and lifestyle variables for every consumer of your product. Uh, and that gives us a very powerful predictive model that we can use to reach into 200 million other Americans and find other people that are very, very precisely uh, oriented towards your brand's values, uh, its buying proposition, et cetera. And um, due to the nature of uh, privacy concerns and that GDPR, you know, if I'm if I have a business and I sell a widget, you know, how much data can you give me? Do you give it to me in like a a, a pseudonymized fashion? Is it just uh, percentages, or you know, I, I would think you wouldn't drill down to individual customers, right? Um, we don't uh, drill down to individual customers, um, uh, lifestyle variables, or um, uh, personal information about them uh, in producing the segmentation analysis or the reports. Uh, and uh, it is important to remember uh, that these um, companies are giving us their customer lists. Uh, and so these are people that uh, they already have a company with and already have some of this data about. Um, but, yes, the, the short answer to your question is we're providing aggregate information um, across their whole customer list. So to be statistically relevant, um, what kind of uh, – how many customers and – you know, what percentage of customers in your group uh, need to have certain characteristics in order to make a campaign, a marketing campaign worthwhile? You know, if like uh, 10% of my customers, nope. you know, are, are older and I want to target older people, is that enough? Or do I need, you know, at least 100 of them? Um, so the, the answer to that is the percentage isn't as important as long as the sample uh, acts on the demographics of your customer base. But we do like to see uh, between 250 and 500 customers uh, in order to have uh, all of the models be at their, their best quality with their low percent error and high statistical relevance. You know, it's funny. I just thought about it. You know, older customers, 
there'd probably be a lot more data about them because they've been around a lot longer. Have you noticed that it's harder to target certain types of, of people than others, either because of their age or because they're, you know, some are more um, uh, flaky than others in terms of buying behavior or less predictive? Uh, uh, yes, um, it's getting kind of deep into the data science of uh, the way that the data is collected and aggregated. Um, but in short, um, it's a little bit of a trade-off because older Americans tend to be fairly established in their homes and in their buying patterns. They've had long relationships with their creditors, um, and uh, they're generally stable about um, their living situation. Uh, but they don't engage as much with the digital economy as younger folks. Younger folks are much more engaged with the kinds of digital economies that produce the data, um, but they are a little bit harder to tra uh, keep track of um, and to uh, to find sometimes in the in the consumer landscape. So we find the data is pretty good um, overall. There is uh, maybe 10 to 15 percent of uh, the U.S. population that doesn't participate in the digital economy for various reasons. And those folks we find are quite a bit uh, more difficult to track. Those can include um, uh, recent immigrants. They can include uh, people uh, from low socioeconomic groups. Uh, and they include the oldest Americans, you know, people who are on fixed incomes or living in nursing homes, uh, that sort of thing, as well as military and college families um, who tend to uh, not engage as directly with the real estate market and, and some of the other consumer major consumer purchases uh, that we use uh, to baseline the data. But uh, overall, I think we have good coverage of the U.S. as a whole, uh, accounting for kind of those basic demographic caveats. Any other uh, interesting insights you've gotten about uh, collecting customer data? Do you see sudden shifts or change in it based on, uh, you know, political events or seasonal events? Um, so there definitely have been uh, some changes uh, in the last several years uh, in the rate of participation in online um, purchase activities. Um, so uh, even when, though we we may have thought, you know, several years ago that almost everybody was participating in the, the e-commerce economy, um, really it was only in, in, you know, the 50 percent range. Now we're seeing, you know, pretty much everybody participating in uh, the digital economy, in e-commerce, and in, you know, making purchases and engaging in other lifestyle activities using mobile devices. So those have been the biggest changes in the last couple of years. I don't think that the political um, or demographic changes that are happening in the U.S. have really impacted the consumer data that much. Uh, I, I think uh, it's interesting to me to see buying patterns and uh, behaviors be pretty, pretty much stable uh, over time. All right, and then in the implementation for a customer, you know, what what does the customer need to have or what does your client need to have in order to make this work for them? You know, what are some of the elements? I guess enough customer flow is one thing. You know, so how much is enough? And what are some other factors that are needed to make your software work? Um, uh, I'll, I'll try to give you an answer, and then I'll ask Ed if he has anything that, that he wants to add. But um, our product works best um, when you have, um, as I said before, uh, at least a, a, a hundred or so customers um, so it's not really an ideal product for people who have no customers yet. Um, it also works well when your products um, uh, reflect a particular um, lifestyle marketing strategy or demographic. So um, products like uh, certain mass market consumer products, you know, paper towels or, or you know, canned soup um, are a little bit more challenging uh, for us to do segmentation analysis because those customer bases really just look like the U.S. population as a whole. Um, but if you have those two things, uh, you know, at least a, a, a hundred or so customers and a product that fits specific demographics, I think that we can give you a lot of information about who your customers are and, and who else might be interested in your product. Yeah. And, and any case studies? Uh, oh, go ahead. Continue. And then I'll ask you if you have any case studies with specifics, like, you know, oh, you help the company and they change their targeting and they got like a 400% higher response rate or something. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, good question, Richard. And um, that's kind of where I was going next. Um, as Scott uh, described the uh, way that our customers interact with the platform. I also want to highlight that um, we've made this very easy to do. It's an analytic tool that uh, anyone can use. 
um, you know, with is certainly a turnkey solution and we help our customers. But um, the examples I'll give you now of uh, some success stories uh, have primarily been done by the customers themselves using our platform with almost no training. Um, but uh, one uh, company in particular, I'm thinking about a customer, um, after uh, them having flat revenue for several years, uh, they were introduced to us. They began using uh, our platform for segmentation and uh, customer identification. They're a direct marketing company for auto dealerships, new dealerships in the um, uh, Southwest. And they experienced a 300% revenue growth uh, based on the customer insights they were getting from our platform. Uh, our platform was profiling the most likely people to buy a particular model car that they were advertising for a dealership. And they were doing um, uh, calling and advertising. And uh, they use our platform to uh, guide you know, the uh, people to go uh, uh, try to contact. We have another good example. It's a women's clothing uh, retail store. They have a brick and mortar stores in uh, California and they sell online everywhere else in the U.S. Um, they sell regular sized women's clothes and they also sell plus size women's clothes. They were in a, a discussion with a, a marketing agency that was encouraging them uh, to start a petite line of clothes. Uh, that's uh, a, a high bar to get over to get into, they were saying. But when they used our platform to do the analysis of their customers, what they learned was that only 7% of their customers were in the habit of buying petite clothes somewhere else. And only about 1% of the U.S. population was doing that. But they learned that 39% of their customers were regularly in the habit of buying jewelry somewhere else, not because they didn't sell it at this point. And uh, uh, 45 percent of the U.S. is regularly in that habit. So they made a strategic decision based on the insight our platform gave them to invest in a, a line of jewelry. Uh, and then our platform could tell them which customers by name that they had were actually buying jewelry so they could start there. And uh, then one more I'll give you is a regional magazine publisher. Uh, they use the insights that uh, came from our platform called Clientele to help their publications increase uh, advertising revenue. So uh, they knew who was purchasing their magazine. They knew uh, what those purchasers' demographics were. And then they could go to advertisers like uh, uh, jewelry shops, real estate agents, and tell them, you know, these are the types of people that are seeing these ads. And that helped them uh, increase their revenue by targeting the people who uh, would want to advertise to their customer base more directly. You know what would be interesting is, uh, you know, people do surveys and focus groups and all that, but what would be better is if they combined the data you could give them. So, you know, if mm -hmm. I have customers, I would want to survey only the ones that have paid me because I don't care about the whiny ones that don't pay me. <laughs> and I would want to survey the ones that buy the most for me or the highest price stuff. So I could mm -hmm. craft a survey to work better to get even better data. Yeah, that, that's uh, a great insight. And uh, that type of research can be done and supported uh, with the information that's gleaned from our platform. Yeah, that's excellent. So um, Facebook and these other platforms, Google and all that, seem to do the same thing, but they don't share anything. They just, you know, use companies and use people to get the data from them. And then they say, you're not getting any of this. So they selectively share it or, you know, maybe they share even wrong insights. Who knows? So it's, it's nice that you guys actually are sharing real insights to companies because this is what they need. Um, any thoughts around what the, the big platforms do versus what you do? and any comments on that? Yes. So uh, that's good insight. And we have heard that feedback from our customers. Uh, uh, because of that, our uh, engineering team is working on a, a technology roadmap. And one of the things we've recently done is begun doing an integration between our platform and uh, uh, platforms like Facebook. Uh, so when our customers come into our platform, they get to see all the analysis. They get to see why certain people are being selected. And then they can go from our platform and push the results from our platform right to that social media platform and then advertise people that they know a lot about. And so uh, they do get a lot more insight that way, but they can still advertise with social media. Uh, we've done a lot of analysis also on Twitter, and um, we haven't integrated that in yet. But, you know, there's another area where you're not really sure, uh, you know, who you're looking at when you see an advertising list from Twitter, uh, because all that information is not made known. But, um, you know, we're able, in some cases, to identify who in our list 
has which uh, Twitter accounts. And then we've done um, by hand some analysis for, for customers on who to advertise to uh, on that social media platform as well. Uh, we think that those models are still maturing, uh, you know, how they monetize those, how they uh, interact with those. We see a lot of changes in APIs from uh, month to month with a lot of those uh, uh, larger platforms. And so we just don't think that's stabilized yet. But, you know, I think they're getting there, and I think they will have their place as well. Okay. And then what's the uh, what's the near-term future of your technology? What's going to happen in the next six months or a year when new bells and whistles and buttons and stuff is coming? Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, from my standpoint, the CEO who's trying to uh, really uh, establish what we're doing in the market and do a lot of educating, uh, I, I like what we're doing to be very stable and useful. Uh, Scott and his team work on kind of next steps on uh, things we're hearing from our customers. So uh, maybe I'll let him just kind of talk about uh, some of the things that he's cooking up uh, in, in his planning and in his mind with our uh, uh, research efforts. Yeah, so the biggest thing that our customers are looking for um, that uh, is in our technology roadmap, uh, Ed, Ed mentioned about Facebook integration, but uh, apart from that, uh, is um, closer coupling between the revenue models of their company and the demographic models that we provide. Uh, and so we've been working on uh, a recency frequency magnitude model uh, that helps companies uh, further segment uh, their audiences uh, by not only the demographic and psychographic information that we know about them, but things that they know about them too. So they want to uh, look at how, um, you know, a particular new uh, uh, discount offering might fare with their most um, frequent customers versus the customers that purchase only occasionally. Uh, they'll be able to do that through the platform. Uh, in addition, uh, they'll be able to combine demographic, psychographic, and um, uh, consumer purchase information uh, to do better predictions about who the best customers for them will be. Uh, so you can imagine in a retail environment, somebody comes in, uh, the retailer wants to uh, make them a you know a 10% or 20% off coupon uh, at the door. The products and or the level of the discount that they'll be offering. Uh, may be based on a model that includes not only demographics and psychographics, uh, but also uh, their own internal data about uh, their customers. Um, so that's the biggest thing right now. And uh, uh, in addition, uh, we're also looking at ways of making segmentation easier and more understandable for smaller clients. Um, so we uh, have uh, created our own segmentation categories uh, that help people understand the data better. Uh, and then we've also been working uh, somewhat on mapping our um, our way of doing business to some of the other models that are out there uh, so that if customers are looking to adopt our technology in addition to what they're already getting from Axiom or already getting from Merkle or what have you, um, they're able to do that uh, uh, technologically with our platform. Okay, very good. Um, do you see that direct response companies use your platform only, or is it also companies that want to advance their brand? And do you think your data can help a company with branding, or is this more just, again, just direct response? Yeah, I think that, you know, the direct response is, um, in the B2C space, is the, the most logical. But because this is an analytic tool that you can really ask questions of, there's a lot of strategic planning that can go on. And then that strategic planning can be implemented in terms of uh, marketing campaigns so that companies can start going after um, aspirational customer groups. So uh, we work uh, for and have done work for a very large um, uh, department store chain uh, across the U.S., and aspirationally, they're interested in uh, catering more to millennials, but currently they have uh, some of the older generations, 45 and up. And so they can use our platform to uh, understand the millennials that they do have, what characteristics are particular about them and not so much the older char the uh, uh, characteristics of their older clientele. And then they can develop specific strategies uh, once they get that kind of insight. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to get a feel for it. And then um, the entry point, uh, dollar-wise, is this for if small enterprises fine to use your platform, or do you need to be of a certain revenue size in order for it to work for you? We really developed this for the uh, small to medium-sized businesses. 
who really have not had access to this kind of insight and segmentation before just because of the cost. You know, if a small to medium sized business went to Axiom, Experian, Nielsen, Merkel, uh, they would have to pay $150,000, dollars for uh, insight like this, and they'd have to wait two to three months to get it, and it would really just be a point solution. Uh, for us, they can get those insights just in a matter of uh, minutes, and then um, they uh, pay a tenth the cost, uh, and they can have that same kind of power at their fingertips. And this is really what uh, technology is bringing them, the way that uh, we're able to leverage kind of the artificial intelligence, big data application uh, uh, for them. Okay. And then um, last question or so, have you found any um, advertising media that, I don't know, you thought was dead, let's say Yellow Pages, and uh, is your platform able to capture uh, newspaper advertising, Yellow Pages, you know, old school stuff? that may not be 100% online, or is it really do much better with, with purely like online media? Well, uh, actually, because of the uh, nature of the data we have, uh, which is uh, very much tied to a person and a geolocation, their home, um, you know, we've seen that the traditional advertising methods are just enhanced. So, um, you know, companies are uh, using our platform and becoming more effective with their mailing. They don't have to do mass mailings anymore. Uh, with our platform, they can uh, pick and choose which households they go to. Uh, the same thing with the uh, example I gave you on the um, marketing company for uh, uh, auto dealerships. Uh, they're only calling the people that would have specific uh, interest in uh, what is being sold because our platform is pointing those people out to them. So the traditional methods have really uh, been a mainstay for us, and it's just made it that much easier and better for them. I think that uh, we do uh, inform the, the newer kind of advertising, the social media kind of outreach. And we have an example there that's kind of interesting. Um, you may remember the uh, rock group from the 80s called KISS, um, mm -hmm. popular you know, amongst a certain generation, and they're still around. Um, they uh, were kind of sold a bill of goods by uh, the social media crowd, and um, they were given insights uh, about their um, – uh, followers, uh, their um, uh, uh, group of, um, you know, people who were signed up for their emails uh, and that type of thing. Uh, and they were told things like, um, you know, your group is tweeting about, uh, you know, Cadillac Escalades was one of them. And so uh, the KISS organization spent a lot of time getting uh, sponsorship for their tours from organizations like Cadillac and others. And that just didn't pan out. And what they learned was that um, the newer kind of data has to be taken with a grain of salt and understood. Just because people are tweeting about Cadillac Escalades doesn't mean they're ever going to buy one or be in the market. Uh, so uh, at any rate, they um, were turned on to more um, traditional methods like us. And so we worked with uh, the KISS organization on their next um, concert tour, and we did a lot of analysis for them uh, in our platform, and they learned uh, a number of things about their uh, customer base, their fan base that they didn't know, and so much so that um, they uh, stopped one of their uh, concerts that they were doing in New York, and they catered to the veteran crowd that they had, which they didn't realize was such a large part of what they were doing, uh, and on stage, the rock group KISS gave a large oversized check to the local veterans organization. And uh, they literally had everyone stand up and uh, they uh, said the Pledge of Allegiance. And this went over very big. And they would not have known that without the kind of analysis, the segmentation analysis that gets done uh, in our platform. So um, these are the types hmm. of things that, that we're seeing and success stories that we're seeing. It's kind of a mixing of the new and the more traditional. Yeah, that's a great example. I like that a lot. Very interesting. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, well, it actually leads me to one more question. In regards to social media, you know, it is all the hype, um, but it's, again, not only do uh, advertisers not have the data because the, you know, the, the giants are using it for their own purposes, but, you know, you hear about fake accounts, fake followers, fake this, fake that. Are you able to tease out the signal from the noise, the real data from the BS because of your platform? Is that another feature of it? Yeah, that's a great point. Scott and uh, our technical team has done a lot of analysis on the noise in social media and other places. So I might just let him uh, comment on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so uh, when you use our platform with a social media platform like Facebook, um, you can do it one of two different ways. So we can either send a model like the demographics that we want to Facebook 
uh, and they can build a Facebook custom audience uh, that will, um, you know, supposedly match the demographic criteria that we give. The other thing that we can do is we can send uh, Facebook a customer list of people that we have determined uh, uh, match the uh, uh, demographics and, and are vetted by uh, the various data sets and sources that we have. Uh, and what we have found is that um, maybe 60 to 70 percent of the real people that we upload from our data set are findable on Facebook. Um, but uh, we find that uh, quite a bit of the people that uh, match demographics that we send to Facebook are fake people. Um, I hesitate, hesitate to put a percentage on it, um, but, you know, depending on the demographic that you're advertising to, um, I mean, I had a large insurance customer um, that does uh, renter's insurance, uh, and we were constantly battling this in the social media platform that the people that the social media platform wanted to advertise to were bots. Um, so I think the advantage that we have in kind of having names and addresses and email addresses and that sort of thing is that when you advertise through a platform like Lionsell, you're only advertising to actual how, how rampant is the problem of uh, fake followers, do you think, on some of the social media platforms? Is it like crazy, you know, where it's a majority of the people are fake or is it uh, depending on the industry or any insights there? I think it depends. I, I, I'm most familiar with Twitter uh, in, in, with, with respect to statistics like that, and it's not my area of expertise, but uh, I think it depends on uh, the brand uh, or the individual. There are companies out there from whom you purchase um, huge numbers of followers, and regrettably, some of the major consumer product brands and some of the major political organizations uh, and even some high-profile Entertainment acts and individuals are actively engaged in that kind of behavior, uh, and so it is a definitely um, a problem that's e uh, noticeable and easily discoverable with the data. Very good. Um, so, what's the best way for folks to uh, get in contact and to maybe set up a demo or you know talk to you about your product and see how it works? Yeah, that's a great. Great question. We do uh, um, kind of live online demos, and uh, we use real data for that. So our uh, People who are checking this out can uh, really see how it works. Our product is called Analyze Clients. Uh, sometimes we call it clientele. And uh, it can be found on our website, analyzecorp.com. Um, or sometimes uh, people will email me directly, and uh, I can set uh, calls up with them. Uh, my email is ed, ed, at analyzecorp.com. And so those are probably the two best ways. Um, I also... Uh, uh, enjoy getting calls and uh, talking to people about uh, kind of what their needs are and if we could kind of meet those needs. And uh, we can be uh, reached at our um, office phone uh, at 703-785-3737. So, uh, you know, those would be the best ways, our website, analyzecorp.com, or me directly, ed at analyzecorp.com, or uh, the number I just gave, 703-785-3737. Okay. Well, Ed, Scott, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. And uh, I really like what you guys do. I've been in marketing for a while, so that's why hopefully I could ask some, some good questions, you know. Yeah, no, you definitely have some good insights on this, Richard. I appreciate uh, your time and thoughtfulness. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.